Hello and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election cycle is well underway and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, new borough presidents, many new city council members, and that's not all. There's also another very important election happening in a city, and specifically in Manhattan, and it's not for a city government position. There's a crowded and competitive race for Manhattan District Attorney, the top prosecutor, the top law enforcement official of New York County, also known as Manhattan. It's a position of immense power and importance. The office holder makes key decisions that impact the lives of many New Yorkers and millions who don't live in the borough or even the city. Millions of people who do call Manhattan home or work there or just visit the borough. These are decisions of life and death, freedom, incarceration, crime, punishment, and more. This is one of the most high profile and important criminal justice jobs in the country. It's technically a state level position, so there's slightly different election rules at play. For example, there are no term limits for Manhattan District Attorney. Candidates for the office have very different campaign finance rules. And although ranked choice voting is starting this year for city government positions in special and primary elections, there is no ranked choice voting in a Manhattan District Attorney primary. But the election for Manhattan DA is happening this year at the same time as all the city government elections with June primaries and a fall general election. It's okay if you didn't get all that, you can watch it again or find information elsewhere. The most important thing is that you know the primary is coming up in June and that you get to know the candidates, especially in this Democratic primary for Manhattan District Attorney. So we're pleased to bring you these interviews with candidates running for Manhattan DA, as well as with candidates for other offices, including mayor and more. These one-on-one -on -one conversations will help you to get to know the candidates, learn about their backgrounds, their platforms, their vision for the city, for the position they want to host, and here for Manhattan DA. So we hope this and others are helpful to you as you sort through your many choices and make an informed decision when it's time to vote. Let's get to today's interview. Joining me now by Zoom is Liz Crotty, a Democratic candidate for Manhattan District Attorney. Thank you for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Good. Uh, thanks for being here. So. You're running for Manhattan District Attorney in the Democratic primary that's set for June. What brings you to this race? Before we get into your platform for the position, uh, tell folks a little bit about your resume and background. Sure. I mean, I come at this and entering this race as a, uh, as a New Yorker, uh, first and foremost. I saw my first crime when I was six, seven years old on 18th Street and First Avenue. Two guys came into the grocery store holding guns, old school style pantyhose over their heads and robbed the grocery store. Juanita, the uh, grocery cl clerk who worked there, who I knew who gave out lollipops, took my hand, walked me to the back of the store where my mom was. I'm from a neighborhood, I'm from Stuyvesant Town. You know, when I grew up, you knew that dry cleaner was hilly. Serge delivered the dry cleaning. Newman was the jelly grow owner. Shorty owned the bodega. Gino was the tailor. This is where I'm from and this is what informs my perspective. I then, um, when I was a young girl, I was walking to the Con Ed fields and some guy tried to get me to get in his car for $5. Um, and it was very scary at the time, but you know, nothing ultimately happened. So I was fine. Um, I was followed home by high school. Crime is real and crime is real in New York City. I have two nieces who I've got a front, so, uh, front row seat you know, to watching them grow up and they grew up here in Manhattan as well. They're 18 and 21 years old right now. You know, they didn't grow up in the same kind of New York that I did. And now my brother and my sister-in-law worry about them coming home at night. I'm from Stavson Town, as I said, there was a series of brutal attacks in Stavson Town before coronavirus and the pandemic hit. I think now we've seen crime spike, shootings are up, doubled, homicides are doubled. There was a six year old who was punched in the street the other day, there's been a shooting at St. John the Divine. And I think that that is the cornerstone of that. My experience perspective is that I 
then I've prefaced that because I, I understand the totality of what New York is and what it can be and what we needed to make it after coronavirus. But, you know, I went to law school, Fordham, and then after law school, I went and worked in the Manhattan DA's office. I was there for six years. I did street crime for four and a half years, tried cases, um, and I understand what the job is. And then after four and a half years, I went to a special case where they are investigating Saddam Hussein, the oil for food program, and the UN. Um, it was a large scale international investigation. And I worked there and I, I understand how white collar crime works. I've worked on those kinds of cases. And I think that that is part and parcel to what we are doing here as a Manhattan DA. And it, can, it doesn't get a lot of airplay, but I think it's just as important. Um, then I went and worked at a firm for two years where I worked on 9-11 terror funding uh, case and un under the Anti-Terrorism Act, uh, the families of the victims of 9-11 can sue state actors. Um, I was there for two years. And then after that, 13 years ago, I started my own practice. And I've been a criminal defense attorney for the past 13 years. And I've been in, um, 100 Center Street, basically now going on 21 years on both sides of the courtroom. I think that this is the experience that we need to really have, look at the system, see what is going on, and, and really how can we fix it and make it better. And, and that's really what informs my perspective. I've been representing individuals every day for the past 13 years. I understand what defendants are going through, what that side of the courtroom feels like, and how can we make it better? So I really am unique in this, in this race because no one else has that perspective and no one else has that long-term perspective of having been six years in the DA's office and 13 years as a defense attorney. And I think that that's where we can really um, make changes that will really improve the entire system. At the same time, not losing the focus of what the DA's office actually does, which is to enforce the crimes, enforce the laws of New York State. And that's the, the, the job is to enforce the laws of New York State. And so that's where I think I stand out amongst the rest. Say a little bit more about this uh, career you've had in, in criminal defense work. Um, what's, what's been sort of your philosophy on which cases you take? Uh, well, I, I think when you're a private defense attorney, you take the cases as they come. Um, you know, there are certain cases that I haven't ever done. I've never done a, um, a child, I haven't done a child victim case. Um, I think those are really hard. Uh, and those are, it, that's a very niche part of the law that I haven't done. I mean, I think that everyone is entitled to a good defense. And, and if they think that I are, they're gonna entrust me with their defense, then I'm, I'm happy to do it. I, you know, I've really been kind of the defense attorney who is very honest with their clients and kind of really see, okay, this is what you're looking at, that this is what you're being charged with. These are the, the three different roads. Um, you know, as a defense attorney, you really learn how to listen and you really have to listen to all the facts and you have to listen to everything they say. And you really, and you, I mean, that's the biggest part about being a defense attorney is listening and, and understanding what the case is about. What uh, did you learn in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office that helped you uh, to be a better criminal defense attorney? Well, I understand, I understand what the job of the district attorney is. And I understand what DAs have to do in order to think that they are doing their job correctly. So as a defense attorney, you try and match those things up and say, hey, listen, you're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to, you know, the job of the district attorney hasn't changed. It, the job is to do the right thing in each and every case. So as a defense attorney, I try and match what the right thing is to do by kind of telling the district attorney what is going on, what are the facts, what are the alternate facts, because the DA only has one side of the facts, the, dis the defense attorney has the other side of the facts. And how do those facts all make sense with each other? How do we get to a result that is fair and just for the victim and fair and just for the defendant. Mm -hmm. And I think that those are the things you really learn as a defense attorney. And if you don't understand what the job of the DA is, then it gets a, it's a harder communication level of saying, okay, this is, this is what we're doing. Because I do feel as though DAs come at it from a good place. 
by and large. And I do think they want to do better. And I think you, what you have to do is match that, you know, but also to what gets lost in this conversation too, is what I've seen as a defense attorney is that like, you have to prove cases beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, we've lost sight of that. If, if mm -hmm. somebody is innocent, the, the case should be dismissed. It shouldn't be reduced. <laughs> no, that's somewhere I wanted to, to get in, in a minute. So why don't we go there now though? Say, so if you're a Manhattan district attorney, how does that impact how you give instructions to your bureaus and your ADAs, your assistant district attorneys? What, is, what does that look like? That looks like at the top, you know, when I started with Mr. Morgenthau on the first day, you said your job is to do the right thing. And, and that's the job is to do the right thing. And you've got to, it's, a, it's hard, but you really got to step out of who you are as an, an assistant DA and step out of who you are as even a defense attorney and look at it as what is what's going on in this community, what is the best thing for this victim, and what is the best thing for this defendant. And, and that's the prism of where you really have to look at these things. Like it's it's not, you know, one time, yeah, I mean, I can give an anecdotal story about it, but it, I mean, I think that that's really the prism of how you have to look at things. So there's a lot of discussion about uh, how, I mean, to me, at least that brings to mind some of, uh, you know, instructions around plea bargaining, things like the, um, you know, the trial penalty, you know, are there, are there things you would alter, you know, as I was asking about sort of how you instruct your ADAs to, to approach, um, you know, let's, and let's, again, let's separate uh, perhaps, you know, away from, you know, some of the violent crime uh, and put it, and talk about, about, you know, more of the nonviolent crime. Are there ways that you would you would change those instructions and those protocols in the office? For, for non, first of all, very few cases go to trial. And if you're you're at the trial stage, you know, you better if you're at the trial stage as a DA, you better be able to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt. That is why you're taking that case to trial. And the defense attorney has some very good defense or some reason why they think that the district attorney's office can't prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt. But, you know, I do agree with their sh and sometimes people don't ever talk about this, but I have found this and I never wanted to out it as much as, you know, there is that pre trial plea where you sometimes really can get the DA to be where they want to be because where you want them to be because they don't want to try the case. So I've gotten actually some pretty good deals right before trial. Um, but I don't think there should be a trial tax. Listen, they everyone has a constitutional right to a trial and everyone should be be able to exercise that right without penalty. And I, I would not, I, I would not uh, have I wouldn't be for a trial tax. I mean, and I think when plea considerations and what I have as a defense attorney is, is always, what can you prove? Not what you indicted, right? And, and I, there's nothing I dislike more than the 105 count indictment because it's kind of like, come on. But you know, I think what you really want to say is what can you prove in each and every case? And like that should be the, the, the matrix and the litmus test for what it can be. And I think, you know, you have to give people an opportunity to, to do better, right? And I say this before, and I've said this in other forums, you know, you really have to understand what I understand after 21 years, there are, and it's, there's more subsets to it, but there's bad decisions, um, bad days, and sometimes bad people, you know what I'm saying? And the real job of the district attorney is trying to parse it out. So it's like, listen, did this person make a bad decision? Did this person have a bad day? Or is this person a bad person who's doing bad things? So, I mean, I think that that's the matrix of what you have to look at these cases for. From. Say a little bit more about how you define uh, what, you're, what you're calling a bad person here. Well, I think a, a bad person is, is a repeat violent offender, you know, and, and also to Again, I've been a defense attorney for 12 years, 13 years. I mean, you meet certain people and they just, they're congenital liars. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're not even honest with you. I, I mean, there's, there's, what goes into to basically a criminal and, and crimes is you have to parse out, you know, the people who you can help and really say, listen, you made a bad decision. You had a bad day. You had some bad breaks in life. We're going to we're going to give you the benefit of the doubt. We're going to hold you accountable. We're going to hold you responsible. But ultimately, you know, the collateral consequences of a criminal charge are huge and that should not be put on anyone lightly. 
So mm -hmm. I, I think that, that you have to understand that at the same time, there are violent crimes out there and there are people doing violent things. And those people, it's a different accountability standard. And, you know, I, I don't have a problem. Okay. So, so let's talk a little bit more about that, especially as it relates to gun violence, which you brought up earlier, and we saw a significant spike in gun violence in, in New York City in 2020. Um, how would you approach gun violence? Are there things that you think the office could better do to prevent it? Are there things you think the office should better do to punish it? Well, well, yeah, no, I think that gun violence has gone up. There's been, I think shootings have doubled to 1500 in, in 2020. Uh, the murder rate is at 462, which is doubled. And the biggest problem you have, uh, according to the NYPD in the New York Times, is that there is an uptick in gang violence and black market guns. So you, uh, I, this is, I am not advocate, when, uh, my solution that I have said at several other forums, and I will say again, is that, they disbanded anti-crime in June. And I understand there were problems with anti-crime. And I understand that you, you cannot sacrifice people's civil rights and you cannot do that. You have to be constitutionally correct. And there is the fourth amendment. But at the same time, you saw the, the, the police disband anti-crime, which were units within precincts that went out and their role was to get guns off the street. That's what they did and that then they got rid of anti-crime and it went up 200%. So I'm saying that this starts with policing and this is, and this is how you, you do it. Like we, the district attorney's office is a reactive agency. So cases get brought to the DA's office by the police and we investigate and prosecute those cases. And so, yes, I think people also have to understand that if you have a gun in New York, you, the, the assumption, if you, you illegally have a gun in New York and that you are caught with that gun in a legal constitutional manner, that you will be facing some amount of jail time. Now, is that true in every case? There are ways around it, but, but those are the things you have to think about. I mean, sure. de Blasio, just one second. Sure. De Blasio introduced the 2016, the Fast Track Gun Court. Um, which they have in Brooklyn since 2016. And, and they have this special court and they have all these things that are in place and crime and shootings have gone up in Brooklyn. So I don't think specialty courts help reduce guns on the street. I, I think they help in how you prosecute these cases and hold people responsible. But we're, we're, it's kind of like, you know, it's this, they're ble the streets are bleeding and we're saying, oh, let's get an x-ray. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, well. So so you just mentioned though that prosecuting the crimes can have an impact, do you think? What what what's the difference? What needs to change than than is currently happening around prosecuting those gun crimes? Well, I, I don't think we have the statistics out on 2020 yet. I mean, I think there is a I heard an a, an unverified statistic. So um, there's a backlog of 4,000 cases right now in Manhattan. And mm -hmm. those are 4,000 cases. What's going to happen with those cases? Even if they've had preliminary hearings, they haven't really been able to prosecute these cases. And people are just going back out on the street and not being held. It's a very, it's a very complicated time with the pandemic and the ramifications of having someone go into prison right now or into Rikers where COVID is running rampant versus, you know, they haven't been proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt yet. So how do you hold them in? And these are very tough. I think on, gun, on many gun violence charges, people have, have been held even during, even during COVID. I want to ask you, you seem to, um, indicate that sort of all gun possession charges are part of the same discussion. We we say a little bit more about if you if you think about gun possession differently than actually firing a, a firearm. No, gun possession and firing are, are, are there are two separate crimes. Sure. It's criminal possession of a weapon versus an, an attempted assault one or an attempted murder or a, a fact murder. So I mean they're def definitely different sections of crime. Do you, have, do you have a different yeah do you have a different thought process around if you're a Manhattan district attorney, how you would treat gun possession, you know, cases differently than, than they're handled now. In other words, do you think that those need to be handled in a tougher fashion, which, you know, is what I'm, I'm get, getting from what you're saying, than they've been handled. You know, we've seen some controversy over that more in Brooklyn, but even in Manhattan as well, you know, there's first time gun possession charges. Uh, sometimes the gun's not even loaded, you know, things like that. 
think it, I think it all depends. I mean, I, I don't, I, you've known this since the beginning of my campaign. I don't speak in absolutes because I have enough experience to know that every case is different. And you have to look at the facts in each and every case. And you have to look at the background of each and every case. What kind of gun was it? Was it, was it defaced? Was it illegally bought? Where was it? How was it being carried? Was it part of a warrant or was it on a person out in the street? Then when the shooting happens, where did it happen? What is the background of all these things? So you can't answer all of these cases, but what you do need to know is that if you do get caught with a gun is that you're going to be held accountable because no one ever talks about the deterrent effects of saying, hey, when people, when I'm a defense attorney or when I was a DA, People come up to me all the time and say, I have such a fear of jail. And this crosses all genders, races, religions, socioeconomic, the whole thing. They're like, people are like, oh, I, have a, I have a fear of jail. And I'm like, that is a healthy fear because no one should want to go to jail. And that is where you go when, when something bad, you've done something bad and you're being held, held accountable. But again, we've seen we've seen the, the other side of that where the longest sentence is not the best sentence. And we've seen that people not, that is not always the way to approach these things. So I think that it's very defendant specific and it's very, I think there's a difference between kids 17 to 25 versus the older person. I think, you know, the younger kids really should be given a lot more benefit of the doubt because it's kind of like, I think they're, even though they might have a gun or have it, uh, you know, it, it, that kind of sometimes falls into more of a bad decision, bad day. You know what I'm saying? Versus the 32 year old who's had his fifth gunpoint robbery. You know what I'm saying? Like the, 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 you can't speak right. in absolutes about all this because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have an abs absolute application. Right, and, and as you're getting it there though, you can break it down into some buckets of, of again, types of crimes and, and how you'd approach them generally. And, you know, I think that uh, I've heard you say that throughout the campaign that you really, you know, try to think about cases on a case by case basis. I think that leaves, um, you know, people at times struggling a little bit to, to really understand how you would run the office. And, and I think my question on that is, you know, does that mean that in your administration, if you're running the, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, there really is a lot of latitude for the ADAs in a in a different way than the office is structured now. Is there uh, are there ways that you would structure an accountability system differently well, than exists now? Well, yes. Well, the, when I was a DA, um, mm -hmm. when I was a DA, you were always accountable for all of your actions, um, and I don't believe that that's changed. Um, I remember when I was a DA, my boss sometimes came up to me and he said, Liz, whenever you talk to me about a case, it's a fait accompli. And I was like, because I was always do something a little bit different. And I would kind of give the benefit of the doubt to the defendant while holding them responsible. And mm -hmm. I found as a defense attorney now, you know, I had a case where the, the assistant wanted to dismiss the case, but the supervisor wouldn't let her. And it was, I, you know, you can go through the facts of the case, but it's like, you know, I just think you have to, you, you're hiring district attorneys and young ADAs, as I was one, for their discretion and for their judgment. And like, that is why hiring is so important. But you're, if you're being hired for your discretion and for your good judgment, and that is based on a variable factors that you go through in hiring, then you should allow them to do the right thing. And that doesn't mean that people are not accountable. They are always accountable. There are layers of accountability built in that have to maybe be improved. But you have to you have to say to assistants, like, I'm going to let you do this. You know, I'm going to let you make the right decision based on all the facts. And you shouldn't have to explain yourself as a DA if you think that the right thing is to dismiss the case. Let me yeah. move us along because we're just in our last five minutes here now. So oh. I do want to hit on a couple other things. I appreciate that. So um, let's talk about so-called white collar crime. Uh, how, are there areas of white collar crime, uh, fraud, money laundering, cyber crime, other categories within that larger category that you think the Manhattan District Attorney's Office needs to be more aggressive about investigating and prosecuting? Yeah, I think when we see uh, cryptocurrencies and the way money is, is being moved now and how uh, cryptocurrencies are not going away and they're only gonna get bigger, I think, being able to, there already are large rings of people who steal cryptocurrency through different hacking methods. And I think 
you know, you want to look at white collar crime in terms of companies who have bad business practices who hurt the average working person in New York City. That happens on a routine basis. That happens with manipulating stocks. That happens with manipulating uh, price reports and stock reports about valuation and people who have invested tons of money. I mean, in, in these companies based on a false report. I mean, and then it hurts the very people whose money means the most. And I think that that's what you have to look at. I think, so white collar crime is important. I think cryptocurrency and being on the cutting edge, we are in the 21st century DA's office. We have to be prosecuting 21st century crimes and how blockchain and Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and all the different various forms of it are going to be really important to the next DA. And being on top of all of those things is really important. I have done some cryptocurrency cases, so I understand firsthand what is going on in those types of cases. And I, I find it interesting that no one's really talking about it in this case, in, in this election. And, and just quickly on that, are there pieces of that that you can illuminate further in terms of what's what's what you see going on that you think needs more attention you know what kind of a case it's it's a manipulation or it's a no it's a theft yeah. and, and different schemes uh -huh. in which to hack people they they know how to investigate people with blockchain they know how to hack people with blockchain and then mm -hmm. also too about blockchain and and cryptocurrency and and how this works it's international <laughs> i mean it is not just manhattan Manhattan might be one receptacle of it, but it is a, it's an international case and the, the victims are in Manhattan. So I think that that's why we have to really be paying attention to it. Let me ask you my final two questions. They're both fairly brief. I know they, they could both be a lot longer, but uh, just a brief answer on each. From what you've seen uh, so far, do you think the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has a strong case to prosecute uh, Donald Trump now that he's a, a private citizen? I mean, you, I, I, I can't comment on facts of a case that I don't know anything about. Um, mm -hmm. So I, 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 I'm not going to comment on that. Okay. And lastly, is there a prosecutor or someone else in a high profile criminal justice role uh, that you point to as a role model, somebody past or present, or even a couple people, if you want to name a couple, um, you know, that gives people even a better sense of sort of who you are and, and how you approach things? I mean, I think that I've always looked to people who hold high standards. I mean, I have, I had was really blessed, you know, in my early career, I had two part judges, Judge Rena Uviller and Judge Carol Berkman, who couldn't have been more different, but they really always had, you could see different sides of the issues and, and, and how it really works within there. And they're, they're two strong women in criminal justice back when, um, when there weren't a lot of criminal women in criminal justice. Also too, you know, one of my favorite people who I have to give a shout out to is this woman, Enid Gerling, who I tried a case against her in her eighties, but I think she was one of the first women as a criminal defense attorney. And she was, and she was a battle ax and she, and she was a really great attorney and, and was always fun to be a case against. So I think, okay. you know, the, the real trailblazers are the, the first women in criminal justice and in 100 Center Street who've really kind of set the standard for all women to come. All right, very good. Liz Crotty, I appreciate the time. Okay, thanks so much. Thank and thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters are coming up in June and the fall and for Manhattan Democrats in this primary for Manhattan District Attorney. There's a lot on the line for all of us and the future of the city and the borough of Manhattan. And I hope this conversation was helpful. Until next time, I'm Ben Max. Goodbye.